Hey guys, welcome back to my channel where we create photorealistic assets together. So today's video is the second part of my organic asset creation process video. The first video, I show you the modeling process of this chameleon. If you haven't seen it yet, I will put the link down below. And in today's video, I will show you the whole texturing process in Mari for this chameleon and also a little bit of a rendering as well. I hope you're ready. This is definitely a one with a lot of ups and downs. Before we start anything, the first thing we always do, of course, is collecting and analyzing references. I collected a bunch of references that I thought was interesting and started to circle out certain areas that I might want to replicate in my asset. Chameleons are definitely an interesting subject to tackle because almost every reference is different. I'm not gonna lie, I was getting pretty damn confused over all the references that I collected. For an asset like this, I can either stick to one reference, or if I feel like I want to have more artistic freedom, I need to pick out the areas that I like and put into one concept. There are already so many different colors going on. I don't want it to get messy, then it won't look good. I want the color to follow the characteristics of the particular animal. It's like being as creative and artistic as you like, but it has to be recognizable. At the end of the day, we are trying to create photorealistic assets. So first thing I realized about this asset is how important is a mask for the in-between scale area is. It gives a definition to the scale and also it will help us create details around the scale. The first thing I will work on is to find different ways to generate a high quality mask for that. I tried a few different things here. First thing is a substance painter, of course. I also tried the poly surface curvature function in Mari. In the end, I did a combination of both, and not gonna lie, I did a lot of hand painting to get a mask that I like. But since this mask is so crucial, the effort is definitely worth it. The next step, I prepared a lot of colorful textures for the paint. Now I have the mask and I have some basic textures. I'm gonna start to build the material in Mari. Gonna keep it super simple in the beginning. All I have is two layers of material. One is the material in between the scales and one is the scale. Before we work on any sort of detail, the first thing I need to decide is the color. I need to make a firm decision on exactly what kind of color I'm gonna work on. I have two main reference I'm following at this point. Once I put on the basic color of my scale, I'm kind of adjusting a little bit and see which one I like better. Not gonna spend too much time on this because I'm pretty sure it will have to change later. I'm starting to block out some combination of color. First thing I'm gonna work on is this brown nose area. I see two main types in my reference. One is they always have this brown nose and then transition into color. And another type is they start straight from color from the nose area. To be honest, I'm not sure which one I'm going for yet, but I know the only way to find out is to start putting down some color. I will spend some time sketching and show you what I have. This is my first pass of a general color. It looks pretty goofy right now, but it's okay. This is more just a test at this stage. I'm giving myself a little bit of time to see how I feel about this current color. So while I'm thinking about that, I do wanna show you a cool little function that I discovered from the Mari extension pack. Ever since I transitioned into using nodes in Mari, there's one function that I really missed when I was using layers and that is to be able to collapse and merge any layers that I don't need anymore. With the kind of color testing I'm doing here, I don't need to preserve all these nodes that I created for it. It would be very nice if I can just bake a bunch of nodes into one paint node and save me some space. I know what you're gonna say, bake points. That is a very good way of doing it, but also let me show you an alternative. It's called Bake Visible to Selected Paint Node. To get it, tap and type Bake. It's right under Bake Point. So you wanna connect the source to all the nodes you wanna bake together, but you also want to view them in your viewport. 
After that, create a new paint node that you want to bake everything to. You want to make sure this paint node is selected. For me, the best way to do it is to double tap on the node. And if the node is selected, you can see it's slightly brighter than the node that's not. Now you can go into the bake node and press bake. Wait for a few seconds. Now, when I look at this new paint note, I can see all these things I was looking at is on this new paint note. This is really a great way to do any kind of experiment you want and just collapse anything you don't need anymore without the node graph getting out of hand. Keep going with my texturing. One thing I realized about Chameleon Scale is that the color distribution is confined within each scale, which means that this kind of blurry paint will never work. When the color started to shift on a chameleon, it's not because there's a color fade, it's because the adjacent scale started to change color, which means this type of broad stroke of paint is never going to work. If I want the color start to change, I need to color each scale differently. To do the next step of color blocking, I start to fill my color within every scale. It sounds like a pretty tedious process, and it definitely is. I will show you the very goofy first version I've done. This is another attempt to block out the color. It started to remind me of the mosaic window glass, and it's far from being realistic. Maybe the color is just too goofy. I went into a color adjusting mode, hoping I can get something that looked half decent. I changed it to this color that I thought is a little bit better. I still don't like it that much, and I really fell into a hole of kept adjusting my colors and hoping that's the answer. Maybe there's no color variation at all, and that's why everything looks so flat and weird. I figure maybe I create some value variation that might make things look a little more natural. Or maybe you just needed some edge detail, some breakup. Doesn't matter what I tried though, everything still looks cartoony and funny, far from being realistic. So I switched the color again. You probably realize while I was trying out different colors, I was also shifting the reference I was looking at. This is when I realized my reference could be the reason why I don't feel confident texturing all these different colors. Although these references showed a very interesting color transition, none of them was actually high resolution enough to show me the actual detail on every scale. I can capture the color, but actually I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with it after that. I think I need better reference. Time to go back to Google, the answer of all things. And I found this one. Not only does it show the color transition of everything, it also provides enough detail for me to have something to work on. I changed my color for the last time. I spent the most time of this project shifting color nonstop. Once I decided on the final color, the whole thing actually only took three days. I think that's pretty common in the creative process. The idea and the concept of it is the more painful and head scratching part. After the color is working, everything else is quite straightforward, and I don't think it's that much different than texturing anything else. Seems like there's dirt on the reference in between the scales, so that's what I'll create first. Once I start the texturing process, I also realized that the sculpt itself needs some work. There seems to be way more beveled edge in between every scale than the one I have currently. Mine is way too soft without definition, so I had to go back to the sculpt and work on that. This is what the fixed sculpt looks like. From the reference, I also realized that a lot of the scales seem to have a circle round edge detail. I went into Substance Painter and tried to generate a great mask for that. Once the mask is imported, I'm working on creating that edge detail. The color of the edge detail is different in different areas. I will be reusing this edge mask multiple times in different areas to create a different look. Another mask I generated from Substance Painter that is extremely useful is a mask for just the top part of the scale. Now I'm going to start to work on some value variation. The top of the nose is clearly brighter, so I'm going to add that into the texture. I also decided to generate another dirt mask because it seems like certain areas are more covered in dirt. 
I'm starting to use the mask I generated earlier for the top of the scale to add some scale detailed breakup and color variation. After spending some time doing some detailed surface breakup using mostly the two masks I showed you before, this is what I have right now. It definitely starts to look a lot more interesting. I think I will start the rendering process from here, not because the texture is fully finished, but because the best way to refine your texture in the end is to actually rendering it. That's when you're really gonna see all the flaws. My setup here is super simple. It's just the HDR with one area light. I have a backdrop to mimic student lighting setup and I colored it dark gray. I'm using a basic AI standard surface shader for Arnold. To create the scheme material look, I'm just gonna use the subsurface tab within the shader. There's no texture plugged in right now. I'm just gonna set the subsurface color to dark red and when I render it, this is what it looks like. The first texture I wanna make sure it works is my displacement. I exported a 32-bit displacement from ZBrush. After I press render, looks like it works. Next up, gonna add my diffuse color. When you connect the texture, make sure you set the filter type to off and also choose UDIM. Now we can see the diffuse map rendered. I want to set up a lighting that I like before I do more in-depth rendering. Every time you change your light, the texture is gonna look different. So it's better to find something pretty stable before I start to adjust my textures. I want to show you what the subsurface color is doing to the object. I always hear people asking me about organic workflow, as if uh, organic workflow is so different from hard surface, there's some kind of big secret that people need to know to texture something organic. To me, they're really not that different. This is probably the only thing that is different you have to worry about for organic assets is the subsurface color and weight. The subsurface color is the same here. I just have a different way to it and you can see the difference and how it's affecting the geometry. For the subsurface weight, I realized that one really good trick for it is go back into Substance Painter and export the thickness map. I love how much variation there is on this thickness map. This is going to make our work a lot easier in terms of subsurface weight. This is what it looks like if I just plug in that map directly and not do any adjustments. You can see on the edge where it's wider, you can see more light coming through and there's more subsurface. I tried to convert my diffuse texture into a different color to serve as my subsurface color. But in the end, I just chose to use a darker orange. I found that actually create quite a bit interesting color variation throughout the surface where this one is way too messy and harder to control. I'm doing some adjustments on the subsurface weight to better reflect what I see on the reference. The idea is pretty simple. The wider it is, the more subsurface it is. And also it's the area where you're gonna see more subsurface color coming through. I'm also starting to create the simple roughness map from my diffuse map. This one is fairly straightforward. All the scales are about the same roughness. The only thing is different is the dirt area in between. I wanna make sure that's a bit rougher. Putting all this map together, this is what I have in the end. The beginning part before I nailed down the look of it was the most difficult. Once that's determined, the rest of it is basically like texturing anything else. You still need to do all the typical texture breakups to make sure things look interesting. One new map you have to create is the subsurface weight, which I have explained in a tutorial. I hope this tutorial is helpful for you. Please like and subscribe if you enjoy my content. For the next part of the tutorial, I will try to tackle the entire asset in Substance Painter. I have never textured anything organic in Substance Painter before, so this is definitely a learning opportunity for myself as well. I hope you have a great and safe day. I will talk to you later.